November of 1595, a small Spanish ship called the San Pedro met its fate on the coral reefs off Bermuda. No one knows who or how many people lost their lives that terrible night. We only know that they left behind one of the most spectacular treasures ever pulled from the sea. This is a story about humankind's enduring struggle with the sea, about finding shipwrecks and archaeological treasures buried in the deep. But it's also a story about losing an even greater treasure, a majestic natural treasure, a treasure not even hidden. Coral reefs and the ocean that surrounds them are changing as a result of human activities. Bermuda's shipwrecks provide markers for us in time, witnesses to this change. If any place on Earth can truly be called Treasure Island, it is this place, Bermuda. More than 150 ships and countless sailors have gone down just off these shores. For divers, archaeologists, and marine enthusiasts of all kinds, Bermuda is paradise. But for sailors, the island has for centuries been feared as the Isle of Devils. No one knows more about Bermuda shipwrecks than Teddy Tucker. Perhaps his greatest discovery was the San Pedro Cross in 1955. The cross came out at the end of October. What was that like when you first saw it? It was, it was, on the, was it, it hidden it was in sand? Down, or was it yeah, in... under the sand and down amongst various bits of wooden wreckage of the ship, it was sort of sandwiched in. And it was face down. Boy, and the sun hit the emeralds, there was no doubt about what that is. I knew <laughs> that wasn't glass. Teddy has been exploring shallow reef wrecks and Bermuda's sea life for more than half a century. Now in his 70s, Teddy has investigated over a hundred wrecks, including the Sea Venture, which carried Bermuda's first settlers in 1609. While today we recognize the need to preserve shipwrecks and prohibit the removal of souvenirs, early Bermudians relied on shipwrecks to build their economy. Bermudians often plundered sunken ships searching for iron, which was in short supply, to make things like knives, nails, and forks. Without a shipwreck, you had to buy it, which was expensive. A shipwreck was a great bonus. It's a very important part in the economy of Bermuda. Perhaps the Titanic is your idea of a shipwreck, lying almost intact, more than two miles below the surface. But because Bermuda's wrecks lie in shallow water and are quickly torn apart by the pounding surf, Discovering shipwrecks here requires having a sixth sense to know where to look and a trained eye that knows how to look. A pile of rocks that blends into the sea floor might actually be ballast from a lost ship. Or what seems to be a rotting tree may be a ship's skeleton. In the case of this 17th century wreck, which Teddy calls the tankard after an artifact he found in 1965, an unusual rock formation tipped him off to the existence of a shipwreck. One of the most significant finds was porcelain. In the old days, when this was first purchased and begun to be traded, how, was it very valuable? How much was it worth? Yeah, but this, this was what the, a real prize item. The first time that this was introduced to Europe was brought in by Marco Polo, and that was when the Europeans got aware of it. They would weigh it and then match it with gold, so it was worth its weight in gold. Teddy's discovery also forms a time capsule that helps us piece together the passenger's final story. That some were Spanish or French, that some were wealthy, some collectors, and that all were returning home from the Caribbean when they were blown unwary onto a little island. Few things strike fear in a sailor's heart more than coral reefs. Coral is dreaded because it's sharp and hard and it grows in shallow water where ships encounter it. Bermuda is especially dangerous because it has 170 square miles of reefs that almost completely surround the island. Captains unfamiliar with the narrow entryways often find themselves trapped within a confusing, deadly labyrinth. But there's a fascinating irony about coral reefs. The same coral that has taken so many lives is also one of nature's most indispensable life givers. Like rainforests, coral reefs are among the world's richest ecosystems. Growing in sunlight, 
Reefs support complex food chains, forming an intricate web of life for nearly one-fifth of the world's known fish species and thousands of other marine creatures, such as the barracuda, the stoplight parrotfish, the moray eel, and this shrimp making a hasty retreat. Coral also helps sustain human life. Millions of people and some entire nations depend upon reefs for their food and livelihoods. Scientists have discovered elements in coral that may be effective against skin diseases and some forms of cancer. Reefs buffer coastlines from devastating storms. In the South Pacific, in the Caribbean, and in parts of the United States. Reefs provide recreation. Australia's enormous Great Barrier Reef is one of the world's most popular dive sites and also one of the richest marine habitats on the planet. But the real wonder of coral is that it is a living organism itself, one that grows incredibly slowly. This brain coral grows only three and a half millimeters per year. One thing's for sure, nature is in no hurry when she creates her treasures. Bermuda's existing reef is over 10,000 years old, and it marks the northern edge of shallow Atlantic coral growth. Teddy, where is coral normally found on the globe? Coral normally lives in a band, or inhabits a band that would be 30 degrees each side of the equator. 30 degrees north, north and of south of the equator. Right. What's unusual about Bermuda is that it is more than 32 degrees north of the equator. The warm Gulf Stream waters that flow by Bermuda enable coral to grow here. Ancient mariners also valued Bermuda as a place to stock up on supplies for their long voyages. And some ships used it as an unscheduled stop, like the North Carolina. The vessel North Carolina, packed with cotton and tree bark, was returning home to Liverpool when, on New Year's Day in 1880, she slammed into a reef just southwest of the island. A salvage attempt to refloat her failed when the ship's massive anchor broke free and tore through her hull, sending all 553 tons to an early grave. Though her midsection has collapsed, her bow remains intact, encrusted with coral and vegetation. The ship is also home to new tenants, such as this opportunistic sergeant major who lives in the ship's stove. Although no lives were lost on the North Carolina, these dead eyes serve as haunting reminders of all lost sailors. Further north lies the shipwreck that I used as the inspiration for a story and film I wrote called The Deep. In 1943, the constellation was in mid-voyage between New York and Venezuela, when she encountered rough weather and began taking on water. As she approached Bermuda, she was swept up in a powerful current and sent smashing onto the reef. The ship was loaded with a motley cargo. She had a, a general cargo, which was unusual for a sailing ship, but she had cement was the biggest part of the cargo. She had scotch whiskey, which was the fresh material salvaged, yo-yos, radios, cosmetics, and the most interesting thing, she had these little um, ampules, which were pharmaceutical drugs she had morphine, uh, adrenaline, iodine concentrates, and incidentally, that's probably still good. When exploring shipwrecks, you often encounter a few natural surprises that are equally as exciting as finding archaeological treasures. Like this goatfish that Teddy and I encounter when we revisit a favorite dive site. Or this unfortunate brittle starfish, a prize for a hungry wrasse. We even get a rare glimpse of a squirrel fish, which usually hides during the day and feeds at night. Feeling a bit threatened, it lifts its prickly back to fend us off. This razorfish doesn't like to be bothered either and quickly buries itself in the sand. Just to the south, at the wreck of the vixen, we come upon schools of chub and gray snapper, both staples of reef life. What's astonishing about life within the reefs today is not what you see, but what you don't. If these reefs and wrecks seem alive today, 
A hundred years ago, they were teeming with life, chock full of groupers, sharks, visiting tuna and green turtles. Imagine the delight of sailors who arrived here in the era of the San Pedro. In awe, they remarked that in just one hour, they could catch enough fish to feed their entire community. And they were afraid to step in the water for fear of being bitten by swarms of fish. But this paradise didn't last long. Barely 11 years after the first settlers arrived in Bermuda, sea turtle populations were in rapid decline. To protect the turtles, the government of Bermuda outlawed hunting them, surely one of the New World's earliest pieces of conservation legislation. A few years later, in 1629, visitor Captain John Smith noted that Bermuda's nearshore fish populations were already depleted. Today, species like the emerald parrotfish have all but vanished from Bermuda's waters. The fish have been fished out, groupers have gone or not visible. It's the snappers, the porgies, the yellowtails, and the other thing that's unusual that's disappeared from here, or it has almost disappeared, is the sagasa weed. Serving as a refuge and nursery for many young sea creatures, the loss of sargassum weed is just as alarming as the loss of marine life. Clearly, the 1600s marked the beginning of a change in our relationship with the sea. While the reefs still claimed an occasional ship, human activity was taking a far greater toll on the oceans. The rate of change accelerated in the early 1900s when grand ships like the Cristobal Colon were being built. It was a magnificent thing. The cabins were wonderful. It had these amber-colored drapes at the portholes with the crown and the anchor of the company's signature on them. Late one night in October 1936, the Cristobal Colon decided to stop in Bermuda on her way to Veracruz. As she approached, the captain tried to fix his sights on North Rock Beacon, but by mistake, he fixed on Gibbs Hill Light, and he crashed into the reef. Several crew members may have perished, but it wasn't the reef that killed them. Rumor has it that members of the crew were executed for losing the ship when they returned home to Spain. Back in Bermuda, locals salvaged what they could, leaving just rusting propellers, twisted metal machinery, and massive coal-burning boilers. Another larger sea disaster, a product of the industrial age, threatens coral reefs around the world. The white patches on this coral are due to a loss of microorganisms that live within the coral tissue and give it its color. We call it coral bleaching. Though less dramatic than the Cristobal Colon, these patches are far more ominous. Corals bleach as a natural response to significant changes in their environment. The problem is, bleaching events are becoming more frequent and more widespread. If they last too long, the corals can't recover and they die, and opportunistic algae take over. Some scientists believe we are now in the middle of the greatest coral bleaching event in history. As many as 10% of the world's reefs may have degraded beyond recovery, and a quarter of the world's reefs are at high risk of dying. If this happens, we will lose one of the world's great life givers for sea life and for humans. So, what is causing coral bleaching? Look carefully again at the Cristobal Colon's coal-burning boilers. Beginning at the turn of the century, ships like this, along with homes, factories, and vehicles, were heated and powered by fossil fuels. Over time, the buildup of pollutants from these fuels has contributed to an increase in atmospheric and sea surface temperatures. We call this global warming. Global warming is having an impact on reefs, but so are ozone depletion, sewage, sediment runoff, overfishing, the harvesting of coral for collectors, all and more caused by human activities. Ironically, the reefs that once sank vessels headed for the wealth of the new world now suffer from the wealth of that world. Daddy, what is this? Peter, that's a, that's a coral spawn that's coming up. It starts up during the day, it 
It's only two or three times a year you see this. It comes to the surface, it floats around during the hot part of the afternoon when the sun is strong, and then it just sinks back to the bottom. As Teddy explained, once every summer, around the time of a full moon, coral releases spawn packages of eggs and sperm that produce larvae. These thick, pinkish clouds can move with ocean currents for miles. When the larvae settle, this is one way that coral can regenerate. Reefs are resilient and in some cases can recover, but there are billions of people on this planet and our actions do have an impact on this fragile ecosystem. Treasure is a funny thing. Should we measure its value by what is discovered or by what is lost. The greatest discoveries in the deep have nothing to do with gold and jewels. Sometimes the most profound treasures are taken for granted. A new storm is brewing, and its warning signs are subtle, almost invisible. Not unlike the reef, that dark night for the sailors of the San Pedro. Only this time, a ship's not at risk. The reef is. We must protect this natural treasure. We must all be keepers of the reef.